Alright, let's get going. Um, I gotta tell you, um, I'm loving more and more and more as I keep going through the diverse messages, you know, that um, we wrote and and as I'm getting to kind of walk through and just see the progression that God has given um, with these, I just love it. I love um, because God knew from the get-go exactly how these needed to roll. And last week, if you were here, man, we talked about that woman that was caught in adultery and they got stoned. Um, and we kind of talked about all the reactions and stuff that went along with that with Jesus and the Pharisees and, and the woman as well. Um, but tonight, we're going to kind of go a little bit of a... I'm going to just continue to take that thought a little bit further. And uh, I want you to think about something. Have you ever had a time in your life where you were like, you know what? I don't deserve another chance. Think about it. And we all talk our noise. And we all have our things. But have you ever had a time in your life where honestly if push comes to shove, you could straight up admit, I do not deserve another chance. You know what I'm saying? I mean, it's only by His grace, although, that we can do anything. We know that. We can't do nothing without His grace. But I've already, I've been there. Now, I think, you know, that again, from the inside out, you know, a thousand times I've failed. Sometimes I want to rewrite that while I'm singing it. A zillion times I've failed. Do you know what I mean? I mean, anybody ever been there in my life yet, you know? Like, screwing up all the time. And then I think that I've got it all down. And I think that I've got it all together. And I'm like, sweet. All right, I'm good now. We are good. I got this all under control. And then God's like, I'm so glad that you have that part under control. And because I'm graceful, I didn't give you everything at once. And how do you get that under control? They didn't. We need to kind of move on to this. Y'all know what I'm talking about, right? You get something down, and you're like, man, my walk is going so good. And all of a sudden, God says, now we're going to deal with this part of your walk today. And you're like, really? But it's kind of cool that out of his grace, he doesn't pound us with everything at once. And out of his grace, every time we screw up, every time we fail, he's right there. You know, forget the Pharisees last week that grabbed those stones and they were chucking them at the woman. You know, well, they wanted to. Anyway. Forget those guys. Who am I to do any of that? When I screw up too. You know, that's going to reevaluate, you know? Now, some people use that as, well, see, see, we're all sinners, you know, we're all humans, so we all screw up. So we all have an excuse to keep screwing up. Hello? That's the long answer right there. Just because we're human doesn't give us an excuse to go screw up, doesn't give you an excuse to go sin. It just gives all of us an understanding of why we do it, because we are yeah. sinful people. And we all have our flesh. You know, for the getaway, man, Lisa and Josh were pounding me at the house, man, every day. All right, what are you giving up? What are you giving up? What are you giving up? And I'm like, I don't know. I really don't know. I mean, man, we gave up a lot coming here. We gave up some of this. I'm just like, I don't, I don't know. I don't know. And, um, and I told Lisa when I was like, I think I'm thinking about this too much. And she's like, no, you are. Because I'm like, I don't want to just give something up. You know what I'm saying? Like, I mean, I can easily go, oh, yeah, I'm going to give up sweet tea. No, seriously, I've done that. I, mean, I, can, I can move on. It's not a big deal to me. You know? I've got enough self-control. I'm good. No big deal. And so I finally just said, because see, in my office, there's these nice four little glass dishes. One's filled with mints. One's filled with skills. One is filled with almonds and regular mints. And one is filled with almond kisses and regular cookies and cream kisses. And I really, every now and then, I'll grab like one, you know, something like that. Seriously, I mean, I don't have to refill it a whole lot unless, like, David Humphrey or some of people come in my office. It's just saying. <laughs> uh, but I, I mean, I just get a couple of things, no big deal. In my car, in Elisa's car, let me clarify, Elisa started this trend. <laughs> So, yeah, the front of that bus with me, I like to hang out with her, so we'll go on the bus together. Um, we have hot tamales, a box of hot tamales. A little right between the car, like where you sit, and like the little whatever console right here on the side. We have a little box of hot tamales, and then Jenna got this whole Ike and Mike thing going on, so we put a little box of that in there. And seriously, I mean, a box of hot tamales, like in our car, will last us, like, seriously, like a month or so. We should have a couple, no big deal. Sherry, one of the secretaries here, 
stupid, 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 stupid thing to tell me. I love Tootsie Roll Pops and Tootsie Rolls and stuff. I like the, the old ones, man. I'm like, seriously, I want you a break. But like fresh ones, you know, they're kind of gooey. I'm all right with that. Well, she's got this secret drawer, and it is a secret drawer. You got to know how to find this drawer. She's got a secret drawer of candy. And there, she said, you're welcome to come in anytime. Well, every now and then, you know, when I'm like a little Tootsie Roll thing, I'm like, all right. And so I'll go in there once every other day, maybe, and get like a Tootsie Roll out of there, you know, and walk away. So I said, all right, guys, look, this is what I'm giving up. I'm giving up the mindless candy. Because I don't care. It's not like I pound it all the time. I like I eat it all the time. I don't care. You know? And then I looked at Josh after I said that. It was finally on Saturday night, too, that I finally decided I'm going to give it up. So I just couldn't figure out anything. And I looked at Josh, and I was like, watch. Every time I go in, I'm going to notice this stupid stuff now. So Sunday, I come up here to church. I'm in my office. I'm starting to get stuff ready for the morning. And I'm like, oh, see, there's the candy jars. I'm good. I don't care. I go over, run in the missions booths and stuff over there in the, in the sanctuary, outside the sanctuary. Come back over here, and I don't know what it was on a Sunday morning, but somehow that bowl of Lucky Charms I had did not work for me that morning. And my body said, you need something now. And I go back in my office, and like, I, I swear, I swear, it was like this vision I could see of the lid raising off of the M&M jar. <laughs> It's not mindless. You need the almonds right now. There's almonds in that chocolate. You need that right now. It's good for you. And I was like, get you behind me, say them, you know. And I'm like, you know. But yeah, I started noticing it. And I went, I got in my car, I'm like, okay, sweet, we're going home. And there's the stupid hot tamales. And I'm like, I'm just about done with this trash. You know, and I'm not kidding you. Every single day. I didn't realize I do this, but apparently. I mean, I go work out in the morning, and I go to the house, I pick up Jenna, I take her to school, and I'm going to take her to school. For some reason, again, I didn't know until this, this week, I always grab, like, just two or three hot tamales, and that's usually actually when I apparently get hot tamales during the day, is after I go to the gym, go pick her up, and I'm heading out to take her to school. And I, I, just, I grabbed the box of hot tamales, and I was like, this kid, what are like, oh. And it's kind of silly, it's kind of true, but I notice the things I can't have. I didn't care. Seriously, I don't care. I don't have to eat that junk. But now that I've said no, I won't eat it. I'm noticing it 24-7. You know? And in my mind, every now and then, I kind of want to justify a little bit. Well, how about a minute right now that God, you smell my breath? Really? Come on. I need a mint, you know? And God's like, you're sweet gum because you ain't getting no candy. You know, you're the one that gave that up. Yes, sir. You know? Um, yes, sir. But I notice now more and more. And it's kind of like with our Christian life. We go through things, and all of a sudden, when you finally decide what you're going to surrender, and we, I think people, people are like camps, and they go to like all the retreats and all whatever, and they get all these, ooh, I'm totally just going to give up everything and totally live for Jesus because I want to speak in his name. I want to love in his name. I want to live in his name. I want all this in his name. And they get all excited until they realize when they get home what it was they said they were going to surrender. Because, see, when you say, I want to be all about being like Jesus, all of a sudden, you got to quit the language. All of a sudden, you got to quit the gossip. All of a sudden, you got to make a choice. Is it worth it treating people like trash? Or is it worth it to go actually love them like Jesus did? All of a sudden, we have a fine line. Hello? All of a sudden, we got a fine line in school where it's like, I'm just doing what I can do to get by in that class and get over with, or am I going to do everything I do for God's glory and do my best? Even if you're best, I mean, for Jenna, dude, if your best is a 70 on the test, then that's your best. If you get a 70 because you're being lazy, that's a whole different conversation. You know what I'm saying? A whole different conversation. And I look back at me over and over and over, and I keep thinking, how many times does Jesus have to put up with me? And I go back to this story, and it's not really one story, it's kind of a progressional story, of how Jesus handled somebody in the Bible. Over and over and over. It's like, Jess, it's be like Jesus talking to Jess, Jess, you want to play with me? All right. I'm going to love you anyway. You wanna, all right, I'm going to love you anyway. Oh, you want to turn around and put a knife in my back? That's cool. I'm going to love you anyway. Maybe that's hard. 
But see, that's Jesus. And if you want to get off the wide road, you want to diverge and get on that narrow road that leads to life. Then you've got to choose. Am I going to actually get on that narrow road and be like Jesus? And it's basically the conversations he has with Judas. In the book of Matthew, chapter 26, I want to start there. And then we're going to kind of just cut and paste a little bit. But Matthew chapter 26, starting in verse 14. I want you to hear what Jesus does. Okay? Matthew 26, starting in verse 14. Then one of the twelve, the one called Judas Iscariot, he went to the chief priest and he asks, What are you willing to give me if I hand him over to you? So they counted out for him 30 silver coins. From then on, Judas watched for an opportunity to hand him over. Stop there for a second. Keep your Bibles open and all that. You catch what Judas is doing here? We know from like last week when we were talking about that woman caught in adultery. Man, the people had already made the decision. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law, they have already made a decision. We want to kill Jesus. They made it crystal clear. We want to kill Jesus. And some of y'all, you know, whenever you try to actually live like Jesus, that's when everybody wants to cut you out. Because they want to take you down. That's been going on since Jesus, I'm just saying. So you're in good company. You're in good company. All right? But they wanted to take Jesus down. Everybody knew that. And Judas steps up, and what does he say? Hey, what are y'all getting me if I hand him over to you? Judas, most of y'all know, but Judas was one of the 12 disciples. Judas was actually the one that kept control of the money for the disciples. Judas was the one, along with 11 others, who walked with Jesus through miracle after miracle. They were all there at the feeding of the 5,000 with that little couple fish and couple loaves. They were all there. He saw the power of God. They were all there, Judas included, in that boat when that storm comes, and it's just coming at them, and they're all freaking out, and Jesus gets up and he's like, what's your problem? Hey. Wait, wait, no. Shh. Be still. He was there. He was there when Lazarus rose from the dead. He saw the power of Jesus. He knew without question he had to be the Messiah. He saw it, he saw it, he saw it over and over. And now, he says, see, we're not back in that day. You know what I'm saying? We're not back in the gospel. So I can't say that I would maybe handle it better. I'll go there later. But I will say this. Judas physically watched Jesus act. And even he said, hey, what y'all gonna give me if I give you Jesus? The people that he knew were wanting to kill him. And Judas is all, oh, what a man. What's in it for me? What's in it for me? But they keep journeying. He actually goes in. I mean, all the disciples walked in with that triumphal entry. All the disciples are doing all this stuff. They get to the Lord's Supper, that final Lord's Supper, that Passover meal. And this we find in the book of John. And I want you to flip over to that. In the book of John, Okay, we're going to start at chapter 13, verses 21 to 30. Verses 21 to 30. After he had said this, Jesus was troubled in his spirit, he testified, I will tell you the truth. I'm going to tell you a lie. I tell you the truth. One of you is going to betray me. His disciples stared at one another, at a loss to know which of them he meant. But one of them, the disciple whom Jesus loved, to be clear, this is John. By the way, what book is this? That's the only place you're going to see those phrases, okay? John wrote this. And said, the disciple whom Jesus loved was reclining next to him, basically leaning on his chest, okay? Simon Peter mentioned to this disciple, John, and said, hey, ask him which one he means. Okay, dude, Peter, if you're right there by John and Jesus, who, okay, I'm, I'm just, I'm sorry, this is what it is, okay? You've got John who's leaning against Jesus' chest right here, 
You're going to be a boy for a moment. You got Peter, who's obviously close enough to whisper to John, hey, find out who he's talking about. Dude, just look. What are you talking about? Okay? But people don't like to do that. Whatever. Okay? They don't like to go straight to the source. Ask him what you mean. So, leaning back against Jesus, John's going, hey, Lord, who is it? Jesus answered, watch this. He's telling John this. It is the one to whom I will give this piece of bread when I've dipped it in the dish. Then dipping the piece of bread, he gave it to Judas Iscariot, son of Simon. As soon as Jesus took, as soon as Judas took the bread, Satan entered, entered into him. What you're about to do, do quickly, Jesus told him. But no one at the meal understood why Jesus said this to him. And since Judas was in charge of the money, man, some just thought he was telling him to buy what they needed for the feast, or to give something to the poor. As soon as Judas had taken the bread, he went out. It was night. As soon as, as soon as Judas took the bread, he went out. We know that when Jesus gave the bread, he said, this is my body broken for you. You follow that? This is my body broken for you. As soon as Judas received that bread, what does Jesus say? What you gonna do? Go do it. <coughs> you wanna turn around and go ahead and turn me over to the Pharisees and teachers' law? Go ahead. Guys, how many of you in this room, if you knew somebody was about to totally turn you over, throw you under the bus like me, nobody ever been thrown under the bus before, how many of you would be like, oh please, go ahead, by all means? Or how many of you would be like, we're going to have a throwdown right now? Come on. How many of you know? Let's be, I mean, adventures, adventures up. We're going to want to fight. You want it. Because how about this? Because what happens is when somebody does it, like I'm totally anti-prank, that's a different conversation. But when you have somebody prank you, what's the first thing you want to do? <laughs> oh, yeah, bring it. I'll get you back. Let's go. Let's go. We do that in our flesh. Somebody wrongs you. You know somebody's after you. What's the first thing you want to do? Go get them back. It's like turning the other cheek. Yeah, somebody doesn't need to turn the other cheek. I'm going to turn their other cheek in a second. <laughs> I'll turn that other cheek, you know. Right? We do that. And especially knowing this, how much did they tell Judas they were going to turn around and give for, for Jesus? 30 pieces of silver. 30 pieces. 30. We know from the Old Testament that is how much it costs for the life of a slave. We'll give you what it costs to buy a slave. A servant that is a bond servant to a master. Yeah. Little did Judas know, Jesus was already a bond servant. He'd already given himself to God as God's only son. They were just acting out on what was going to happen. Jesus had already turned around and said, I'm going to lay my life down. He told him that over and over and over. He's going to lay his life down. But Judas, he looks at him in the face with all love in the world and says, what you're going to do? Do it quickly. Mind you, right after saying, this is my body broken for you. Now go on ahead. Do your thing. What amazes me is that the other disciples were looking around clueless. Looking around going, I wonder what's going on. Not really getting it. Because come on. John, the disciple whom Jesus loved, where was John at at the time? Reclining on his Where was he at? He was leaning against the breast of Jesus Christ. Here's Jesus, and he is leaning up against him. Man, it's a bro love, I'm just saying. Bible said it. He is leaning up against Jesus, leaning against his chest. John's right there. John and James, if you look back a little bit in the New Testament, man, there was a moment well, they're referred to as the sons of thunder, meaning these bros had anger issues. You don't get the name sons of thunder because you're very gentle spirit. I'm just saying. Peter, who was, hello, look how far away from the conversation. Peter, we know how his temper is. Here he comes in people after Jesus, and what's he doing? Pulling out a sword with the worst name ever and chops off a dude's ear. <laughs> Always going to tell me, whoo, quit. Girls, y'all are so much more graceful than us guys. I just have to testify for you. 
Because us guys, we can get hot-headed, right? Come on. Come on. We didn't matter. We can get hot-headed. I'm telling you, if John and Peter knew what Judas was going to go do, do you think they would have sat there going, oh, Judas is the one going to betray him right now. Okay. Sons of thunder. Really? Or do you think those two boys are going to be out going, oh, uh-uh. Judas, get back. I'll tell you what's up, I'll betray you right now. Really? Kind of uncomfortable, but you know it's true. How many of us have ever had those moments in our life when we're like, I'm so going to live for Jesus. I'm going to walk. I'm just going to have it. And that somebody comes along to help you betray Jesus, and you're like, okay. Hello? Just saying. Are we really too far away? Are we really that far away? I'm going to go back to Matthew. Back to Matthew, and I want, to, I want you to catch how that kind of played out. So starting in verse 47, 26, verse 47 now. 26, 47. Jesus had just gotten to pray in the garden. And I love how Matthew put this. This is actually in several spots, but I love how Matthew put this. But Jesus had just got to pray in the garden. He not only prayed for his disciples. By the way, what was, what was Judas? What was Judas? He was, disciple. He was one of them. He had just got to praying for him. He also just got to praying for all of us. That we would be seen that we are one. <laughs> that we'd be seen that we are one. That David, Campbell, and I, when you see us, you know that we're one. We share the same love for Christ, and that's just the way it is, and that's how it is. And me and Brooke, one. Jesus prayed for that, that it would be so evident, that we would be so unified. For everybody. He also prayed pretty passionately, because he's like, now my will, but yours be done. Jesus, you, God, I know you're telling me, this is Jesus, God, I know you're telling me that I've got to go to the cross. I don't want to, but now my will, yours be done. And then what happens? Right here in verse 47 of Matthew 26. He's talking to his disciples. Who, by the way, had been sleeping again and again. And he says, while he was still speaking, Jesus to his disciples, Judas, one of the twelve, arrived. Stop there. Do we know who Judas is already? Yeah. Have they made this point clear throughout Scripture, by the way? Yeah. Well, God doesn't just say stuff just to be like, oh, by the way. He wants you to really catch it. Judas, one of the twelve. One of the inner circle. One of the ones who should have known better. Because he's seen the power of God through Jesus Christ. <laughs> Judas, one of the twelve, arrived. With him was a large crowd armed with swords and clubs, sent from the chief priests and the elders of the people. Now the betrayer had arranged a signal with them. The betrayer being Judas. The one I kiss is the man. Arrest him. And going at once to Jesus, Judas said, Greetings, Rabbi. And he kissed him. And then Jesus replies, Friend, hello. Friend, do what you came for. And then the men stepped forward and they seized Jesus and they arrested him. I'm going to go there. I'm still going to go there. <clears throat> we live in an extremely homophobic society. We just call that for what it is. When you go into other cultures, um, things are different. Things are different. A lot of the European cultures, that greeting with that kiss, just that kiss on the cheek, that sign of that close friendship. Okay? That bond. When some of us have been to Africa a number of times, okay? And the reality is, when you're in Africa, okay, you're not just sitting here, you know, you're not holding, like a guy is not going to sit there and hold a girl's hand. But I'll tell you straight up right now. Pastor Sunday and some of the ones that I work with in Uganda, we're sitting there talking to people. Come here, Tyler. And we're just, it's just this, right here. We're just talking to people. This is all it is. This is all it is. And I'm telling you right now, see, for some it's like, there's some awkward sauce going on over here. There's no thought about it because 
See, I know who I am. And God has blessed me with a hot wife, so everybody else in the world should know what's going on. <laughs> I have... I'm sure there's no taking. I have no desire for Tyler in any form or fashion other than the fact that he's a brother in Christ. Just saying. So this, to me, that's culture. It's what they do. However, if I was not his friend, if Pastor Sunday, because he did, the first time they grab your hands and start holding it, you're kind of like, this is new. <laughs> and it's a true story. True? Oh, yeah. Josh, Eddie? <laughs> when they start holding your hand, you're like, oh. and it's one thing, like shaking the hand, but no, they're not letting go. <laughs> <laughs> okay? You just move on. You just move on. But if I were to do this, I'm holding Tyler's hand, and Tyler comes up a hand, and he comes up like this, and I'm like, you know what I just told him? I'm not your friend. I'm not your friend. You follow? When you're in Europe, a lot of those cultures, that green, like I said, with the kiss. I mean, Paul talks about that green, but another with a holy kiss. He ain't talking about no get funky fresh for your thing. It is that sign of, again, that bond. We are family. Some of y'all people, and I'm, and I use Tyler as an example for a purpose. Tyler, once this summer hits, is going to be with me more than he's going to be with his family. Okay? This summer. More than he's even going to be with his family. We are family. When people talk, they got, we're the most twisted family tree, I swear. Yeah, that's not the last. Okay? People are like, who's Edison? People are like, oh, that's one of David's brothers. Wait a minute. What? Who's Josh? Oh, yeah, one of David's brothers. Why are the last names different? What's going on? I don't get it. We really are. See, guys, sometimes y'all are too cool. But some of you girls, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Because you're like, you know who your sisters are, right? Right? So guys, you get down to it. You know who your brothers are, don't you? Don't you? You know who your brothers really are. Because you build a relationship. We've got the society thing going on, but we don't believe in that. You guys, with Judas, I want you guys to grab this more than anything in the world. He had a relationship with Jesus. He was not just some random schmuck that was always arguing with Jesus like the Pharisees and always doing whatever. This was, G this was Judas, one of the disciples, who spent all this time traveling with Jesus over and over and over and over. And I love the grace of Jesus Christ who just looked at him and said, hey, he, he had to give the kiss. He even told them, the one that I'm going to go show that I'm tight with, the one that I'm going to go show that respect and that intimacy of that bond with, the one I'm going to go do that with, yeah, that's the one y'all want to turn around and go grab. Mm. That's the one I'm trading over to you for your silver. Thanks for the game. Thank you so much. Now, I don't believe with all my heart that Judas realized the full weight of what was going to happen. I think he probably thought they were going to shut Jesus down. Mind you, everybody had known, and the disciples had talked about how the Pharisees and teachers of the law wanted to kill Jesus. Really, Judas? Are you that dumb? Yes. But I, I'm going to give him some credit. You see, I'm not Judas. I know what the Bible says. I know all the line that goes through there. But I'm not Judas, so maybe I'm going to give him some grace, because I want grace when I screw up. Maybe Judas just thought to beat down, shut him up, confide him, get him away. He got some profit out of it. He gets to go do his thing. Because see, when they crucified Jesus, what did Judas do? He threw back the money, which they were like, we don't want that money. That's blood money. Thanks. He went and hung himself and killed himself. Because see, Judas could never see the hope. Go back down that line. Jesus says, this is my body broken for you. Now go do what you want to do. Go do it quickly. Then after he's praying for everybody, and he's got these number of disciples that keep falling asleep instead of praying, he then comes up. Judas walks up to him, gives him that kiss, and says, hey, knowing that that's who they're coming to get now because Judas gave the son. And Jesus just says, hey, friend, 
What's she gonna do? Do what they do. Do what you came for. I'm right here. I'm not gonna fight you. In fact, when Peter wanted to fight, he told Peter enough actually healed the dude's ear because of Peter's aim. Okay? Just more grace of Jesus. Judas was there. He saw Jesus not fight. He, he heard Jesus look at him in the eye. I love looking people in the eye. And some of y'all, it makes you extremely uncomfortable. And you know what? I really don't care. And I'll tell you why. The eyes are the windows to your soul. I want to lose in your eye. Because if you're talking to me, and that's one thing, like when you're in a loud area, and like, okay, that's not sometimes so I gotta like, look down, so I can kind of really focus on just listening. That's one thing. But when we're in a room like this, I have no problem with your eye open face. It's no big deal. I have no problem. Now, if you got something you want to hide or kind of put away, for you, it might be a little awkward. I'm just saying. I know this for me, when somebody's trying to look at me, and I'm like, this is what I want to know, so I'm just gonna start fidgeting and not looking. Y'all know. Y'all know when mom and dad come in the house, right? And you're like, the last person you want to look at is them. You don't want to look them in the eye. I love how Jesus just keeps looking in the eye. Judas, can you not see the hope? We know that Jesus was going to die on the cross. We knew this was coming. But I want you to catch this more than anything else tonight. Jesus gave Judas time and time and time again. A relationship. He even called him, he still called him friend. Did he know what Judas was turning him over for? Yep. Did he know the price that was being paid? Yep. Did he know that it was a 30 pieces of silver? And did he know what the end result was going to be? Yep, yep. Yes. Absolutely he knew. And he still said, friend. And then he said, hey friend, really, will you think about what you're doing? But we need to think about this. Did he do that? Did he try talking him out of it? Nope. Do you think? Because you know what? It's all about that personal decision. Some of us like to make that decision for other people. I've done it. There have been people that I see that screw up over and over and over and over, and there's finally times where I've been in the past. You know what? You have screwed up over and over. I'm done. I'm done. Friends that I've just have been like, forget you. I've tried with you over and over. In the flesh, do they deserve me to keep on going? No. But if I look at my Savior and I say I want to be like my Savior, who am I to give up on somebody else but he didn't give up on me? All right. Who am I? Y'all look at your school. Look at the friends you've had around you at different times. And I know, oh, Lord, have mercy, I know. Some people wear you out. I get it. I get it. Some people wear you out. That's just the reality of life. Some of them your family. Some of them that one person in your class. Some of y'all that are maybe getting older and they've been around like you. You see that one person that they're on fire for Jesus one day, and then the next day they're living like trash, and they're on fire, then they're living like trash, and you're just like, I'm done with them. Praise God, Jesus wasn't done with you. Hello. Right? So you keep trying. Do you know how much they keep hurting? Yeah, I know. I'm not going to put somebody that is totally living like trash, hey, let me put you in the spotlight in front of people. I'd never do that. Because to whom much is given, much is required. Because I guarantee you, if I started doing some things that weren't right, do I have any place being right here, speaking the way I'm speaking? No. But do I deserve to be kicked out? No. No way. I need to be called friend and shown hope and redemption and love. How many of y'all know people that you've seen people drop them like bad habits, man? You know what I'm talking about. You've seen it. People just get dropped. I long for the day when forget just last week when I was talking about, you know, you without sin go to the first stone. Forget that. Move past that now. Because some of us are really good about not judging. So praise God for that. Move past that and now go to this peace. Yeah, you're back at that. If Jesus is willing to give time after time after time again credit, and some people take advantage of that, yeah. 
Didn't Judas take advantage of that? Yeah. And by the way, who really paid for it in the end? Jesus or Judas? Jesus stayed true. Look where he is. He's at the right hand of the throne of God. Judas didn't receive the hope. Judas is the one that kept taking advantage. And I don't know what his eternal destiny is because I'm not there. That's a different conversation for another day. But I do know this for a fact. He killed himself. He gave up his life. One of the most selfish and, in reality, hopeless acts you could ever do. Hopeless acts. You've got to be rock bottom to say, I'm done. So who did it really cost in the end? The one who kept getting chance after chance? Or the one that kept blowing it chance after chance after chance? You're only accountable for your walk. You're called to encourage other people in their walk. If they're believers, encourage them in their walk. But I can't make Michael do a thing. I can just love him no matter how he acts. That's all I can do. And say, friend, I'll give you another chance. Friend, I'll give you another chance. But because I'm not Jesus, friend, I hope when I screw up, you give me. But how about we work on, let's neither one of us try to screw up. That way, if we're both on page, becoming more like he called us to be, trying not to keep screwing up and having to give each other chances, now we can actually start working on maybe two others. And give them a chance after chance after chance. And it's spread, and it's spread, and it's spread. And all of a sudden, people go, why are you still loving me? Because Jesus loves me. Why are you still being there for me? And proving it, hello. Because Jesus was still there for me. And you know what you've got going on now? A lot of people spreading a lot of things called hope. Because the more chances we give others, the more likely they're going to see the hope that they can be found in Jesus Christ. The day you cut them off of chances is the day you just declared you don't deserve redemption. I don't want to make that call. And I love you guys way too much to allow you to make that call either. So let's just keep encouraging each other hanging in there. If somebody's barking about somebody, and they're fed up with somebody, you look at them and say, Casey, you know what? I get it. I know. I get it that she is on your last nerve, but you know what? You can do this. So instead of bad mouth her, let's pray for this person that's wearing you out. Let's pray for them. Let's find a way to encourage him. Because you never know that one day when you look, because maybe Eli's at rock bottom, needing a chance after chance, and you never know if the one line that I'm about to say right now is all he needs to follow to make him turn the corner. And then living the life that God wanted him to live to begin with. Instead of hopeless. Hello? That's what I want to get home for. What do you want to be? God, I thank you so much just for your redeeming grace. God, I thank you for second, third, five zillion chances. Because though a thousand times I failed, still your mercy remains. And so, Father God, I pray that you would just continue to redeem me from the inside out. And God, that that grace might overflow on others, bringing them encouragement, Father, from your word, from who you are. And God, that they might then let that just redeeming love just continue to take over them to give others those chances. Father, that none of us that are listening to this right now, Father, none of us in this prayer would ever sit back and just say we're done with somebody. But God, that we would continue just to show your love and your light. Even though God, sometimes that is so difficult. But who better knows that than your son Jesus, you gave for us. And so by his strength, we know we can do it. Help us encourage one another. Help us press on. And Father, when we talk to others, may it not be with a twisted motive. 
that God may it be with just a loving motive that comes from us becoming one like you desire us to be one. May we be known as a people that offers chance after chance after chance, just like our Savior did, that we might be transformed to be more like him. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen.